I haven't felt this much testosterone since the golden days of Xbox, when my brothers and I would come home from school to play Halo and Gears of War. This? This is a manly man's game, and it had me calling my Amazon delivery guy, brother, while pounding my chest in the name of duty, honor, and fear of failure. I've never played a Warhammer game before, but I have heard the name. And after the pumped up adrenaline fueled action that I just experienced, I not only want to check out the other Warhammer games, but I want to dive into the seemingly massive, hell even the word massive is an understatement, lore. It seems like this universe that I was completely unaware of spans so wide and goes so deep, it would take several years to learn everything. It would have been nice to know more about the Warhammer universe just so I could understand the context and the references in this game, but Space Marine 2 actually does a very good job at giving newbies the basic gist of everything. I'm going to do my best to explain the full story of Warhammer 40k Space Marine 2. Forgive me if I make any mistakes here, again, this is my introduction to Warhammer as a whole. I'll try to quickly look up certain things and fill in gaps where I can think of, and if you're a fellow brother, consider liking and subscribing because it greatly supports the war effort against the Tyranids and the forces of chaos. The Emperor protects. Planet Kadaku is under attack by Xenos, aka aliens, specifically the Tyranids. You can see them hell diving from the sky as ground forces look up to watch their impending doom descending upon them. A computer screen pops up relaying this message and we also see something called Project Aurora and how it is absolutely important, ending with... A kill team called the Death Watch, looking like they're the horsemen of the apocalypse, become battle ready as the Tyranids begin wrenching their doors open mid-flight. The Death Watch stands on business, slaying them as they come until the walls rip open and the Tyranids swarm them, causing one of them to skyfall to the ground. Tis but a scratch. As we familiarize ourselves with the Tyranid-infested environment, our mission is clear. Kill the Tyranids with a virus bomb. It's a small trek, slaying Tyranids, finding our fallen brethren, grabbing the bomb, and bringing it to the orbital launcher. And as we prepare to send the bomb into the stratosphere, we are assaulted by a swath of Tyranids. And seeing them come towards me reminded me of playing World War Z or Aliens Fireteam Elite. They do their best to stop us, but the job gets done. The bomb launches and goes off. However, even after the explosion, the Tyranid threat still approaches, and yet our Deathbringer here does not relent. He continues to fight and take them on. He's blowing them up, crushing and slicing them until he gets shot and then falls off a wall. But then he gets up, slowly removing his helmet to reveal his face. Glorious music cueing. And I have no idea who this guy is. But I looked it up, he's from the first game. He spits out blood, gets up and pulls the old, I'm not locked in here with you, you're locked in here with me. Our protagonist then proceeds to beat the ever-living shit out of the Tyranids. They kept coming in, and he just continues to bash them, taking bloodbath after bloodbath, execution after execution, and at one point, they even sent in a giant Tyranid, an absolute behemoth, and Titus does not give a flying fuck. He said no fucks are giving any flying lessons today. This absolute monster of a man starts going toe to toe with this behemoth and he's even like, even if you kill me, I'll leave you with scars so deep you're going to remember me. A scripted cutscene ensues and Titus gets a giant claw through the chest and right before the finishing blow, he is saved. When Titus wakes up, he sees this chaplain watching him sleep. And here, you can see that Titus has extremely heavy scarring around his neck, arms, and legs. The chaplain who's watching him sleep says that he was remade through Rubicon surgery. If you're part of the, like, million people who are new to Warhammer, you might have some questions. Questions like, what is Rubicon surgery? Well. When a space marine undergoes the Rubicon Primaris, he endures an incredibly painful and risky procedure. Surgeons open him up, 
from head to toe, crack his ribcage, and push his body to the edge of death by suppressing his natural healing abilities. Three vital organs are then implanted, the Magnificat, which enhances growth and organ performance, the Belisarian Furnace, which boosts his strength when facing a fatal blow, and the Sinu Coils, which wraps his tendons in metal for increased durability. Once the surgery is complete, his heart is restarted, and if he survives, he emerges as a new, stronger Primaris Marine. What is the difference between a Primaris Marine and other Space Marines, also known as Astartes? While Space Marines are already genetically enhanced, Primaris Marines are bigger, faster, stronger, more durable, and can use newer weapons, making them the next step in evolution for Space Marines. The Chaplain tells Titus that he's being reassigned duty stations and that his almost entire century of servitude to the Death Watch as penance is no more. Some may wonder, what did Titus do to deserve being punished? Well, nothing. He was just suspected to be possibly corrupt. Why? Because he is unnaturally resistant to something called the Warp. What is the Warp? The Warp is an alternate dimension made of pure psychic energy, also referred to as the Immaterium. It is the source of all psychic powers in the Warhammer universe. Chaplin tells Titus that in order to have true absolution, he needs to faithfully serve without fault. With that, we meet Captain Akaran, who gives us rank and tells us to go protect some guns on the planet Kadaku and help with the evacuation process. We also meet our fellow brothers in arms who will be accompanying us for the rest of the game, Chiron and Gadriel. Gadriel seems ambivalent about Titus. Chiron is glad that we're here. While on the ship heading down to the planet, Gadriel is eyeing Titus up and down, observing and noting that he was with the Death Watch. Then he remarks to Chiron that Titus is over 200 years old and could not have been born a Primaris. You see those service studs? Our lieutenant is over 200 years old. He couldn't have been born a Primaris. <clears throat> Gadriel asks a lot of questions. Landing on the ground, we are briefed on the situation, but you can just see the situation around us on the ground and in the sky. War. After assisting the Cadians with securing their base, we enter the swamp. Here, we take down some more enemies, executioner style, on the way to the guns. Chiron asks Titus how the Tyranids compare to the other Xenos. And Titus explains that the one thing that makes them so dangerous is their hive mind. They all act and think as one entity in unison. Coming up to a squadron of Cadian troopers, they've sealed the gate to their base. They explain that they had to, to trap the Tyranids inside. We need it open. So after surviving the next horde, we begin making our way through the base. Striking foes down, we end up also saving a small Cadian force that was trapped in the base with the Tyranids. After which, they assist us by helping us spearhead our way in to retake control of the facility. Our next objective is to protect the Cadians and the orbital guns while it charges. During our defense, I abused the heck out of the Melta gun. Seriously, this was my favorite gun in the entire game. True to the name, it melts faces. After a bit, the targeting system for the orbital guns goes out. And of course, we need to manually raise the pedals on the satellite dish, but we also need to deal with the gargoyles trying to destroy the satellite. After almost dying to the sheer number of enemies crashing down around us, my brothers and I succeed. Initiating the targeting sequence and watching that giant lobster spaceship blow the F up. However, our glory is short-lived as when we return, we receive news that Elian, a brother, died during this bout. Gadriel relents at Titus because he and Elian had served together for a couple decades. I only wish he had lived to see that hive ship burn. I fought beside Elian for two decades. He could not have been defeated by Hormigans. There are creatures more deadly than Hormigans down there. You should not have let our squad be divided. He is gone, Sergeant. Duty is all. Because of his brother dying, amongst other things, Gadriel's mistrust and doubt towards Titus continues to grow. And eventually, it's going to reach its peak. 
And if you pay attention to them, I really like the small side interactions. The game does a successful job at building up even the side characters. You end up being able to relate to them and understand who they are, what they're about. They aren't just some randos who happen to be serving with you, they are Gadriel and Chiron, your brothers. We're going to see more of Chiron's personality later. But reporting back to Captain Akron, as I'm walking towards him, he tells me to get over there, but like I was already doing that. He briefs us on our next mission to escort a mechanical archmage named Nozick, whose name actually appeared on that computer screen in the beginning of the game. He's the one who sent an encrypted message about Project Aurora. Akron tells us that Nozick does not want to leave Kadaku without something that's in his lab. On our way to get Nozick, we meet three new brothers, and the chaplain is there to let us know that he's watching us. Yeah, for some reason, he's just suspicious of Titus as well. But back on Kadaku, Nozick, not wanting to leave, has us head to his lab to retrieve some data. But before leaving, we're informed that three whole squads had already been sent in an attempt to retrieve said data, but none have made it back because something is out there. Titus knows that there is a hunter killing our brothers and reveals it's something called a lictor. And then we come to a section where the game gives us a bunch of supplies right before entering an open area, so we know that a boss fight is coming. Lo and behold, it's the lictor, who kind of reminds me of a predator with his ability to go invisible and then strike us. After brutalizing the lictor, we move towards the facility. I also noticed something pretty cool here too. When you switch weapons, the weapon that you used and put down displays blood, conveying that it's been used. It is a small, sweet attention to detail that most games don't actually do. And then, on the elevator going down to the lab, we hear Nozick talking to us through the Vox, and he's talking smack, saying that our performance is pretty much crap. Titus calls him out on it, and Nozick responds that he's not talking smack, he's just stating facts. Spare me the insults, Magos. Statement error. Insults. I engage in pure analysis. That made me chuckle a little bit. But once we're down there, the Rippers let their presence known. They're like these tiny rats, but in this magnitude, they're like waves that seek to devour us. But we have a fighting chance with the use of a flamethrower. The halls in the facility start to change. We can start seeing guts and meat slathered on the walls. Titus explains that the Tyranids are collecting biomass. The humans are gathered, dissolved into something like soup, and then feeding tubes come down from space to Earth and are collected for the Tyranids later. Now in Warhammer, the Tyranids' primary goal is to consume all organic matter to fuel their growth and evolution. That's it. That's the Tyranid agenda. They are controlled by the hive mind to relentlessly consume entire biospheres, entire planets, and then they move on to the next one, their hunger forever unsatiated. Down at the lab, we fight our way through the hordes and then head over to the control room to transmit Nozick's data over to him. Upon asking what the data is, Nozick responds that it's not space marine business. With that, Nozick finally agrees to board the ship and vacate the planet. But during the ascent, the Thunderhawk that Nozick was on is shot down. Grabbing jetpacks from inside the lab, we enjoy a nice sequence of us bringing death from above amongst the Tyranids, on our way over to check on Nozick. And this next part is actually disgusting. We're blocked by a wall. But it's not just any wall, it's basically a wall of humans. It's a wall of stored biomass. Let that sink in. We need to get through that wall. And trying to place charges to blow up said wall, I actually get incapacitated and Chiron decides to watch me die and get folded instead of reviving me. When we do get to the crash site, Nozick has been impaled. There are no survivors. Instead, there are markings on the sides of the crashed Thunderhawk, and Titus sees a word, Imura. But he is also drawn in by something inside the ship. 
a resonant ringing and a deep grumble, but as he walks closer, Titus just falls to his knees. Just then, another ship lands. It's a salvaging detachment, with a tech priest frantically ordering the men to find it. Another Astartes tells us that we can't go on the ship on Captain Akron's orders, but Charon insists. The cameraman focuses on Nozick's remains being torched. Once on the ship, we see what was grabbed. It's a cylindrical canister with black energy visibly emanating from it, and Titus seems to react to it with a grimace on his face before he blacks out. When he finally comes to, Gadriel is gossiping very loudly to Chiron about Titus right outside his room. While debriefing Akran on the situation, Titus informs him that something called Chaos is involved in this entire situation and that they are the reason that the ship went down with Nozick in it. For those wondering what is or who is Chaos, Chaos is slash are the inhabitants of the warp, that alternate dimension with all that psychic energy that I mentioned a while ago. Chaos gods and demons live in the warp, in the immaterium. Chaos and warp go hand in hand like peanut butter and jelly, but they are still separate from one another. Okay, and so you might be wondering, what is the goal of Chaos? What do they want? Well, Chaos simply wants power and dominion over the universe. So, yeah. Continuing the conversation, it is revealed that Project Aurora is actually a weapon, and that Chaos wants Aurora. With Nozick dead, the research and progress to enabling Project Aurora lies with his apprentice, Morius Luz. But nobody knows where he is. So, we get tasked with going down to a Mechanist facility down on Avarax to retrieve his location. But one lingering question remains. What was in that canister on that ship that Titus reacted to and why did the enemies not take it? Why did they bring down the ship, kill Nozick, but not take whatever was inside the canister? Captain Akaran dismisses Titus, steering him back to the main mission. On a war-torn Avarax, we land and make haste to find Luz. We need to make our way across the facility by using the cargo elevator, which is, of course, broken. We bathe in the blood of our enemies on the way to the control room above us to get it starting again. And once we do, we board it, but are quickly assaulted by the Tyranids who are tearing at the chains and trying to end us. However, we make it to the other side, safe and sound, and now it is time to trudge through the facility. Inside, the Tyranids are plotting something, and Chiron even asks, why are they just stalking around us and not attacking? Titus responds that they are mere drones being controlled by a, and I quote, worthy adversary. It's interesting to see and be reminded that the Avartes find glory and honor in battle. I don't know, that's just like a very manly warrior ideology to have. The mere idea of it makes me want to pick up something heavy. At one point, a Carnifax, that giant crab alien thing that stabbed Titus in the chest in the beginning, starts to claw his way through a door, and we have ourselves a boss fight. I have slain the Carnifax. After getting payback, Titus and Gadriel remark at the kill, calling it a glorious sport. These guys are literally built different. Finally, we get to the machine that will tell us where Luz is, and it tells us that he is at somewhere called the Temple of Thassian on Avarax. But before leaving, Titus notices a file, a file named Project Aurora. Now Titus, opening that classified file, sees that the Mechanicus are reconstructing an artifact of some sorts. I feel like if I had played the first game, I probably would have understood this reference, but anyways, we try to get the location of the artifact, but before we do, the reactor inside is beginning to destabilize and a meltdown is imminent. So we fight off waves of Tyranids as usual, shut down the reactor, save the city, and then we report back to Captain Akaran about the Mechanicus trying to trigger Project Aurora. Now Titus, having seen this happen before on a planet Graia, again I think it's another reference to the first game, warns Akaran about the cataclysmic disaster that is about to occur. But Akaran silences Titus, saying that the Mechanicus are acting under the orders of the Primarch. 
who after looking it up is somebody called Primarch Gilliman, the head of the Ultramarines. Damn it, Captain, if chaos is here, if they get their hands on this thing, enough! I will hear no more on the subject. Now, ultimately, Akran is looking out for Titus because for him to technically be questioning the Primarch is more than enough to get Titus in trouble. But now, it's time to go get Luz, but not before Gadriel again complains about Titus, keeping them in the dark, accusing Titus of not trusting them. You criticize the captain for withholding intelligence, and yet you treat us to the same evasive obscurity. Stray words have cost me dearly. So you do not trust us? Brothers, calm yourselves, lest you face the chaplain's censure. Crash landing on Avarax, we begin cutting a swath through the Tyranids once more, meeting a new brother, Varelis, who Chiron actually already knows. You see, Varelis saved Chiron's life once by cutting off an arm of an orc that was overpowering Chiron and then beating that orc to death with his own arm. God, Warhammer is so awesome, dude. So we tell Brother Varelis that we're going to help him and the Cadians by taking back a bridge that is under Tyranid siege. Along the way, Gadriel complains about Titus again. Brother, what happened on Gryer? Nothing good. Can you be specific? I would sooner focus on the mission at hand. You are withholding information relevant to the mission at hand. Mind yourself, Sergeant. Your behavior has been erratic. You force your way into classified files. You tell us nothing. Gadriel, we deserve to know who is leading us. This conversation is over. I'm sure Gadriel won't bring that up again. Once at the bridge, we have a short boss fight against a giant floating brain called a Neurothrope, and my brothers actually watch me slaughter this alien, probably feeling inspired. Informing Varelis that the Neurothrope is down, we cross the bridge, and then Brother Varelis arrives with some other Space Marines offering us a ride and help in searching for Luz. A little ways away, we find a dome, and inside we find suspicious Cadians. Chiron is wary, and Varelis and Titus begin to question the Cadians, urging them to rejoin the main force, but they refuse. This scene was extremely intense. I was on the edge of my seat for this one. The tension builds until Gadriel calls them deserters, prompting Varelis to demand that they contact their captain. Chiron spots a mark on one of the Cadians. It's a trap. A bomb detonates and a steel rod impales Varelis, dropping the Titan instantly. I saw in another video though that Varelis doesn't actually die, he gets turned into something called a dreadnought. I wonder how that works. A portal then opens up in Space Marines with an Egyptian aesthetic step out. Chiron is pissed. I had to look up who these guys were, and here's what I found. In short, they are called the Thousand Sons Space Marines, a traitor legion serving the Chaos God, Zinch. They are soulless warriors bound by magic, which is why when we rip their heads off, we just see magical space dust, or what that looks like. The Thousand Sons are skilled in sorcery and psychic powers. But diving in deeper to find Luz, we also find more heretic marines, and Chiron, who is heated right now, charges right at them. I mean, he is furious. He is completely disregarding Titus's orders, and that's not characteristically Chiron, because for most of the game so far, he's been very by the book. He follows orders, no question. He just shows veneration to the chain of command, and he serves well, but here, he flies off the handle, and he is rearing to murder the traitors. He jumps in front of a portal with the Thousand Suns flowing through, and Chiron is just having his moment, beating them all down. After reconvening with him, Titus chews him out for being selfish, reckless, and potentially costing them the mission. I get that Chiron's brother died, but I also feel like there's more here. Why did Chiron become so livid? And why does his hatred for the heretics seem to burn like a torch? Moving on, we find the heretics trying to breach a door, and ascertaining that Luz is inside, we ready ourselves to destroy them. After doing so, we tell Luz to open up and come with us, as he is Nozick's replacement. On the ship, Titus tells Luz that the power source, which I think is the artifact from the classified files, 
is dangerous, that the Mechanicus should not be messing with it. Luz tells them all to just chill out, that he's just following the will, the orders of the Omnissiah. Okay, so for those of you wondering who the Omnissiah is, also known as the Machine God, it's this entity worshipped by the Mechanicus, the dudes in the red robes like Luz, Nozick, and the ones back on the Battle Barge. The two factions work together because it's more peaceful and it's for the greater good. Now, upon hearing Titus's name, Luz is astounded and seemingly suspects that he is the same Titus that supposedly died a hundred years ago. Luz states that the Titus from the story held the power source in his hands and that no Astartes should be able to survive after that. Now, of course, Gadriel and Chiron want to know what Luz was going on about, but of course, Titus just tells them to come off it. Now, back at the bridge, Akran tells us that the Chaos forces are now showing up all over Avarax. With pressure from both Chaos and the Tyranids, the Space Marines are forced to use Project Aurora to combat them. However, Titus wants to warn Lord Kalgar, who again is the head of this chapter of the Primaris Ultramarines, and Akron says something is blocking the Vox communications. Now, Titus knows where to look, and he discovers that a Hive Tyrant is the cause behind the comms interference. So the plan is to split up into two teams. One team is going to kill the Hive Tyrant, while the other team is going to make sure that the message to Kalgar gets delivered. And of course, before departing, the Chaplain wants to express his doubts about Titus's intentions. And of course, it wouldn't be complete without Gadriel adding on top of it. Concerns about your intentions. It is the chaplain's responsibility to ensure our chapter remains pure, not yours. Your erratic behavior is plain for all to see. And now, I find you have a history of it. I am doing my duty, as I was then, protecting a system from ruin. But Gadriel doesn't stop there. On the ship, preparing to disembark, Gadriel says that they should fight the Hive Tyrant with the other squad instead of playing Courier. However, Titus cements the absolute importance of sending the message to Lord Calgar, and Gadriel pesters even further, demanding to know about Titus's history. That message has to get through. What exactly is that message? Speak your mind, brother. I searched the archives. You were once captain of the second company, and then you disappeared over a century ago. I was serving with the Death Watch. There would be records. Not for a black shield. A black shield? You would erase your chapter markings. I would die for these colors. Then why? I was accused. It was my penance. What were you accused of? Corruption. Brace for landing. Walking through the base, we see the Cadians preparing for battle, some getting executed for desertion, and then we come to a broken gate that four men can't lift. So, Titus does it for them. We engage in battle with the Tyranids and eventually the traitor Astartes, and after cutting them down during a moment's breath on the elevator, Chiron states that the heretics are there to stop them. But Titus reminds him that the forces of chaos are masters of deception, that it might seem like they're trying to stop them, but that they should not fully operate believing only that, because they're likely up to something else. With a bridge down, our path is cut off. Requesting jetpacks to be sent down to our location while putting them on, Gadriel, again, frustratedly complains that they should be fighting and not worrying about delivering a message. But Titus tells them that if they fail to send the message, a massacre would happen. Gadriel, not being told everything, throws a tantrum. He flies off and decides that he wants to have his cool moment too. So he starts cutting down enemies, acting like he's him, but shortly after, he gets knocked down to the ground, drops his gun, and is about to get gangbanged by the gargoyles. Yet, he is saved by Chiron and Titus. Then Titus picks up the gun, shoves it in front of his chest like, yeah, 
you're not him. Gadriel, probably embarrassed, doesn't say anything, he just falls back in line like nothing happened and they all fly off together. Making it to the relay, our mission is to protect it while the Hive Tyrant is getting taken care of. And brother, we are bombarded with all kinds of Tyranids, and they are tearing into us. At one point, three Carnifexes show up and it really had me sweating, but luckily, the other squad kills the Hive Tyrant, breaking the synaptic connection between the Tyranids and killing off the ones around us. As we make entry into the Relay Sanctum to deliver the message, Gadriel tells Titus that he requests to be put on a different team when the mission is over. I need no commendation. Once inside, it looks like a giant mechanical library almost with bodies in the walls. That was actually pretty bizarre. And then when we get inside, a tech priest, Elidias, tells us that we shouldn't be there. We insist upon sending the message to Calgar, and Elidias says that now is not a good time, because if they tried to send a message, which they do by using the warp, again that realm where the psychic energies derive from, chaos forces could attack. The creepy lady in the middle, her name is Naoma, says to give her the message anyways. Reading our minds, she extracts the message and then begins to send it to Lord Calgar. Now, something goes amiss. She starts freaking out and then screeches at Titus, calling him a heretic who aims to kill Lord Calgar. And bro, Gadriel hopped on this like nobody's business. He's just been waiting for this exact moment. Gadriel starts trying to kill Titus, and in that scuffle, a gunshot goes off. Chiron killed the annoying, screeching lady. Immediately, a portal opens up, and out comes Imura. And if you remember back on the crashed ship with Nozick, Imura was written in blood. That was his name this entire time. Imura remarks how we dance for him. I guess trying to send that message did actually allow Chaos to attack, and we have our boss fight right here against Imura. And he annoyingly flies around and does a bunch of teleporting. However, we eventually are able to fend him off and he flees. So after the fight, Gadriel asks Chiron how he knew it was chaos, how he knew to shoot. And Chiron simply explains that he quote unquote came to know the mark of chaos since he was a boy. I would be interested to know Chiron's origin story. Before leaving, Titus tells Gadriel, I understand your actions, but your suspicions end here. Are we clear? Yes, sir. Back on the bridge, we find out that Luz has the power source and is on a facility in Demirian. Captain Akran says that maybe Titus was right not to let the Mechanicus continue with Project Aurora. The issues at hand now are taking down the mechanism that draws in reinforcements and a giant enemy vessel where the enemy is drawing power from. Akran, asking for solutions, denotes that our squadron has developed a reputation for unconventional solutions. Now, Gadriel has this crazy idea. He says to get an old battle barge and then ram it into that giant enemy vessel. Using an ancient battle barge as a battering ram, an unorthodox approach. Disapprove. On the contrary, it is inspired thinking. I reluctantly second that. Why reluctantly? Because it will go to your head. Chaplin calls us over to ask us why Titus is being accused of heresy. Chiron tries to explain that the woman who accused him was being puppeted by Imura. However, Chaplin tells him to be quiet because Titus needs only answer. Titus reiterates the same thing, that the Psyker was possessed. When asked why Gadriel tried to kill Titus, Gadriel admits it was a misjudgment, and Chaplin does his usual, I'm watching you, speech. After some morale boosting speeches, we begin our flight to Demirium. During the flight, Gadriel and Titus have a heart to heart. Gadriel says, sorry, Titus says, it's all good, and then explains that when he was a younger captain, he had made a life-ending mistake once where he didn't listen to his brother before. So, like a true leader, Titus accepts fault, just as well as Gadriel, establishing a solid bond within the Brotherhood. 
feeling hyped up on brotherhood and camaraderie. I'm ready. I'm ready to go down to Demirium and and uh, and take care of business. And while diving down to Demirium, I managed to hit every piece of debris that I could find, and I actually got a steam achievement for it. Boots on the ground, it's time for another bloodbath. Taking a moment to absorb the literally out of this world atmosphere, it's hard not to appreciate how amazing this game not only plays, but looks. Snapping back to it and remembering that we need to place a beacon near the enemy vessel to help guide that old battle barge towards cutting it down, we head to a nearby cathedral and activate said beacon. Immediately, heretics come to try and annihilate us, but we obliterate them, allowing the sword of Atreus to crush the enemy vessel. Now there's no time to rest because the enemy still has Aurora. Advancing to the Mechanicus facility, we fulfill our duties, sending death to our enemies. Imra makes his presence known by whispering into our minds, but we remain ironclad, disposing of the traitors at the dig site and then heading on inside. While demolishing the heretics in the ruins, I actually learned that we could charge our Warhammer for a heavy attack, and I thought that looked pretty cool. Then Imura goads us even further by talking about how they're so great and how they're going to destroy the Aurora weapon. Amura really messes with us down here. I mean, he speaks into our heads, has us talking to nobody, at one point shows us an illusory copy of Titus, and then we have to kill him. Then after that, Gadriel apparently speaks heresy. What will you do with the artifact? Crush it to dust. If it has no effect on you, why not use it? You dare suggest heresy, Sergeant? I said nothing. And I heard nothing. That degenerate clouds our minds. Only he doesn't. Closing in on the source, the heretics seem to be frozen in time and unable to move. It looks like they were all trying to go towards the source. It doesn't matter to me. I just smash them because they're right there. Luz stands at the end inside of a barrier immersed in his work. We tell him to stop. However, his demeanor is all very matter of fact and optimistic about his life's work with Project Aurora. Luz is convinced that only the best can happen while Titus knows the worst that can happen. We shoot several bullets at him, trying to get him to stop, but Luz insists that he's just going to prove it to us. Amura shows up above the barrier, trying to attack Luz, and when it doesn't work, he summons this Hellbrute. It's a demonic beast of half-flesh, more machine, it's a monstrosity. Soon, we crush its jaw, rip it off, and then we rip off a human-looking head inside of it? Wait, 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 what? What exactly is this thing? Luz activates Aurora, and immediately, Imura disappears with Luz stating that the forces of chaos cannot be here while Aurora is active. Luz, talking about closing great rifts and transference of alignments, turns the device sending Aurora upwards and through the ceiling, and that's when Amura returns, gloating. He appears under the barrier and then blasts Luz. I guess he loses. Amura grabs the power source, dips, and the ruins begin to crumble all around us. However, we smash through a stone wall on the side to safety and then we find our way up. The squad realizes that Imura had deceived everybody this whole time and he was pulling strings from the shadows, tricking Luz into thinking that he wanted to finish his work and then use Aurora. Imura killed Nozick to make the marines think that he was going to go after Luz next so that we would bring Luz out of hiding. Imura didn't want to stop Aurora, he wanted to activate Aurora this entire time. Outside. Chaos has spread, and the Cadians have had their minds broken. Gadriel denotes that the human minds are incapable of handling the evil energy, and casually, Chiron postulates that they should probably put them out of their misery. Like, it's just another Tuesday for them. Luckily for the Cadians, we don't have time for it. Luz's mistake had tremendously empowered the forces of Chaos. Soon after, we get a signal on Akaran. We have his location. Rushing through our enemies, quite literally rushing through them, like we're running through the humans and they explode on impact. When we touch them, they splatter. It's like we're juggernauts. With horrific mayhem surrounding us, Titus is asked how it compared to his experience with Graia, and he states that this is significantly worse. The rift has opened up so wide that the most harrowing dangers are inbound. Rejoining our brotherhood and convening with Captain Akaran, we discuss the situation, and without knowing exactly where the power source is, 
our only current alternative is to pass through an energy field on foot. Akaran says that ballistics aren't going through, but that he's seen enemies walking through it, and so now they are gonna try and do the same thing. Battling alongside our brethren, we fight like hell, making haste towards the obelisk. And what's about to happen is going to go down in gaming history as legendary. This is such a badass scene. So awe-inspiring, I was just, on the edge of my like I was my heart was pounding I, I felt so much empowerment this was such a cool scene once at the field Titus raises a banner to assemble the marines it's victory or death from the portal pours in multitudes of heretics more rifts appearing and even more servants of chaos ushering in picking at us at our brothers one by one but remaining stalwart and steadfast we continue to kill in the name of honor, duty, and fear of failure. However, with the waves coming and crashing down on us with no end in sight, our meager numbers dwindling with each second, it seems like we're about to be swallowed. Among the hordes of enemies encroaching upon us, a hell brute bashes through the portal. Titus, seeing it with an uncertain and discouraged look on his face, pauses for a short moment. And then he continues fighting, seemingly having accepted that death is imminent, but glad to have died a glorious death with his brothers. The Hellbrute steps in front of them, blows up. Surprised, they look up to the sky to see reinforcements. It is Lord Kalgar. He descends upon the enemies with a calm wrath, clearing them out and saving his men. God, that, that scene, I was just like, hell yeah. Hell yeah, brother. Lord Calgar explains that he received the message. During a debrief, he orders a solution. Gadriel, on a hunch, thinks that if they turn the smaller obelisks like a key, just like Luz did, it would reverse the effects of the Aurora device, closing the door to the Immaterium. Calgar asks if Titus trusts Gadriel, and Titus nods. With that, Lord Calgar gives the company a morale-boosting speech, and we all charge together towards the colossal bird demon, splitting some of the ultramarines into teams, including ours, to find and turn the keys to the obelisks. Finding the first key, Titus is about to turn it, but Gadriel shoves him aside, and with great difficulty, he turns it, but he looks tortured in doing so. I guess Gadriel wanted some sort of redemption? A green energy beam fires from the obelisk to the aurora, the other squad successfully turns the key on their side, and another green beam fires from another obelisk. After executing a hell brute, a third obelisk fires a green beam. Moving forward, we find a dreadnought and a hell brute fighting. The dreadnought is Brother Valtis, and he shoves his machine gun arm into the face of the hell brute and performs a fatality on him. Hungry for more glory, Valtus demands to be led to the enemies so that he may slaughter them. He cuts down multitudes of enemies with his barrage of bullets and even kills a hell drake by throwing a giant statue at it. Now at the fourth obelisk, Chiron wants some glory for himself. Pain deepens devotion. He painfully turns the key and it's time to burn the rest of the heretics to ashes. Emura, seeing things going sideways, commands the bird demon to magically stun the battlefield. Titus, Gadriel, and Chiron are able to get behind something so as to not get hit by the wave, but everybody else, friend and foe, becomes frozen. Lord Calgar, being the absolute beast of a man that he is, takes it right to the face. But for some reason, he just doesn't care about it. He doesn't care about the magic. He doesn't care about that giant bird demon's magic. He just walks forward like nothing. I mean, how strong is this guy? Even Titus is surprised to see him do that. With Emura disappearing into a black rift, Kalgar walks into it and we chase him. We're now in the warp, in the Immaterium dimension. It looks like the place we were just in, but things are upside down. A lot of things are frozen and we can still hear the sounds and echoes of others, but the atmospheric sound itself is dulled and has this almost um, muted resonant hum. 
A little ways forward, Imura does his big bad evil guy speech, and we also find Kalgar. He's fighting, but it looks like he's trapped inside of something far away. Whatever it is, Imura makes it disappear, and we have ourselves a boss fight. During this fight, it's more or less the same thing as back at the Relay Sanctum. Imura does a lot of disappearing and reappearing, a lot of peekaboos. The only difference is now he can inflict blindness on us, turning the screen black, numbing our senses while he tries to assassinate us. But we just parry him. He also tries to get the giant bird to kill us, but after shooting it in the eye a few times, we win. I think. We reawakened in some sort of abyss, surrounded at attention, lined up in formation, ranked amongst the thousand suns. Moving forward, we see Kalgar. He's fighting, roaring, brimming with a golden aura, and shooting the enemies down. When Titus approaches him, he asks him for some security verification to ensure that we're not an illusion. Titus proves to Lord Kalgar that they are the real deal. And from there, it's a straight path to the energy stream where Imura is. Waves of enemies march towards us, but Lord Kalgar smashes through them. When we finally get to the energy stream, the bird demon shows up and starts messing us up, smashing Chiron into the ground. Titus attempts to enter the energy stream to get the artifact, but it's too much for him, and then he falls to his knees. Kalgar orders Titus to get up to finish the mission, and with a bellow, Titus musters up the strength to grab the artifact and snap it in half. Amura, still talking, realizes what happens and begins to disintegrate into the energy stream, and then everything fades to black. And then we hear Lord Kalgar's voice commanding Titus. Rise, son of Gilliman. With his eyes opening, Titus is surrounded by his Brotherhood of Steel. Kalgar once again orders him to rise, that his duty is not over. And with help from his brother, Chiron, Titus stands and shouts, For the Emperor! For the Emperor! Back on the battle barge, Titus receives commendation on a job well done. After the short ceremony, Kalgar apologizes to Titus for not being able to help him out earlier, referring to Titus getting accused and forced to serve in the Death Watch. Kalgar states that the Inquisition was wrong to suspect Titus because his devotion to duty and honor is unmatched. Titus is then told that he is going to be changing duty stations to serve elsewhere. But before leaving, we say goodbye to Captain Akron, and to Gadriel, and to Chiron. You'll be missed, my lord. I will not forget the blood we have drawn together. Nor shall we. I owe you both a debt. You have restored my faith in brotherhood. We shall await your return. Courage and honor. Courage and honor. honor. Chaplin walks up to us again to tell us that he still doesn't trust us and that he's coming with us to our new duty station. Chaplin then takes off his helmet, music plays, and I have no idea who this guy is. But Titus does. He says, Leandros. I guess they know each other. If that's the case, why did he wait so long to reveal who he was to Titus? Boarding the ship, we take one last look at our brothers and hopefully we get to see them again. Thank you guys for watching, see you on the next one.